Okay. Okay, um, thanks everybody for uh, coming to the uh, conference. Uh, it is our great pleasure today to have Dr. Ying Ying Fan um, uh, to give a keynote for today's session. Uh, Dr. Ying Ying Fan received um, her PhD in operations research uh, and financial engineering from Princeton University in 2007. She's currently professor of data sciences and operations and also Dean's associate professor in the USC Marshall School of Business. Uh, she's also a professor of economics and an associate fellow of the USC Dornsai Institute for New Economic Thinking. And Dr. Fine is both of, uh, is a fellow of both Institute uh, of Mathematical Statistics and the American Statistical Association. She's also a recipient of the Royal Statistical Society Guy Medal in Bronze and the NSF Career Award, among many other honors and awards. Uh, and Dr. Fine's research interests including statistics, data science, machine learning, economics, big data and business applications, and artificial intelligence and blockchain. Her papers have been published in uh, leading journals in statistics, economics, computer science, information theory, and biology. So today she's going to talk about her recent work on large scale network inference. Welcome. Thank you very much, Yong Tao, uh, for the very, very generous introduction. Uh, so before I get started, uh, I also want to thank the organizers, uh, Len, uh, for inviting me to this great workshop. Um, and uh, uh, both Len, uh, I know both Len and Yong Tao for many years, uh, probably more than 10 years. And they are uh, not just uh, great friends, they are uh, and even more great researchers. And uh, also, uh, I'm I'm glad to see that uh, Miami B School has, um, has been developing so well, and uh, especially statistics group. And, and uh, Yung Tao should take a lot of credit for, uh, for the group here. Um, all right, so uh, let me uh, start my talk. So today I want to share my recent research with um, everyone here. And the research is about the large scale network inference. And this is a joint work with uh, Jen Ching Fan at Princeton University, uh, Xiao Han and uh, Jin Chu. Um, the work was completed uh, when um, Xiao was a postdoc uh, of me at UIC. Um, all right, so, um, um, you know, we all live in a networked world. Um, to name a few examples, um, uh, there are a lot of recent interest in science about the brain network. And, uh, you know, where uh, mo many of us are in B school and we talk about the stock return networks, right? And uh, there are a lot of studies about social ne networks in business as well. Um, so in this network applications, uh, one popularly asked the question is, uh, if I have N individuals, um, and I also have the connectivity of the N individuals, can I use the connectivity data to group the individuals into a few clusters, right? And this question has been asked by a lot of researchers. And in the past decade, it received a lot of attention in statistics community. Um, my talk today uh, is different from the specific problem I just asked, but it is related to it in the sense that we want to go one step further because existing research mainly focus on um, estimation aspect of the problem. Uh, they, mean they want to estimate the um, group ID of the individuals or the parameters in some structured parametric model of network data. But here we try to do inference. And specifically, if you consider a network, we want to answer the question that, uh, can we quantify the level of uncertainty that a given pair of individuals belong to the same community? Or some people may prefer the word cluster, okay? And you may curious, so why are you interested in such question and why estimation of clustering is not enough? Um, so to make it clear, so let's look at a toy example. Uh, this example is about a very famous network data, which has been studied uh, um, a lot in network literature, probably too much. Um, so this data is about a university, uh, a credit club network data. It was the first published uh, um, in Zachary 1977 paper. So in this network, uh, um, there, there are 34 members. Um, and 
here we have a graph representing the connectivity of the individuals in this club. Um, edge means two individuals spend much time together outside of the club activities. Okay? Um, and at some point, because of internal politics, the 34 individuals split into two communities. Um, so the question here is, if we have the connectivity data of the 34 individuals, can we use just the connectivity data to infer the two communities that the 34 members um, split into? Okay. Um, so before I talk about existing work, um, let's look at the uh, affinity matrix, um, which is often used to answer the question instead of the graph, instead of using the graph directly here. Um, so affinity matrix is equivalent to the graph here in the sense that uh, um, you create a 34 by 34 matrix uh, with binary entries. And one means the two individuals are connected. For instance, um, individuals one and two, you can see that there is an edge between them. So corresponding in the affinity matrix, there is a one here. Okay, And if you look at individual one and individual 15, uh, 15 is here, and there is no edge between them. So the corresponding edge entry in the affinity matrix is zero. Um, so uh, then the problem becomes, okay, how about matrix data of binary entries? Can you use this matrix data to answer the question, okay? Um, like I mentioned, uh, this data has been studied a lot in, in the literature. And here I just uh, took out some uh, existing work in the literature. Um, so this graph shows a result uh, if you use a parametric uh, network model, the so-called stochastic block model, then this is the uh, two communities you end up with, okay? Um, and you can see that, uh, um, I, well, I will show you a math form, mathematical form of stochastic block model later on. But at this point, I just want you to remember one thing. Um, if you look at uh, this, uh, result, you can see that each node is only allowed to belong to one community. So that's the restriction here, restriction inherited by this model. Okay, so this is by stochastic block model. And, and we, you know, as a statistician, we all know that, okay, we don't believe any model is 100% correct, right? So we try different models. So what if a different model is used? And in this plot here, um, a different model, which is called a mixed membership model is used. Um, and then you have the result summarized at this. Okay. Um, the major difference from the previous plot is in this new plot, okay, green is one community, red is another community. However, we have some nodes, we have some individuals with mixed community membership, like node nine, um, you know, it has some membership belong to the red one, but also some belong to the uh, green community. Okay, so that's a difference here. So here comes the problem, right? So if you try two different models, then you get different results, right? For instance, if you are interested in nodes nine and uh, three, then the conclusion you get from the first model will be different from the second model. And in fact, uh, from the first model, node nine and node three, in terms of their membership, they are completely different. But if you look at the second model, they are much more similar, right? So here's the question. So which result should we trust, right? And here I want to bring up the very famous quote by George Box, all models are wrong, but some are more useful. But here, which one should we consider more useful model, right? And this is actually, our motivation, at least one of the motivations we want to study the problem. Um, so in other words, we want to consider a very broad model setting, which includes both models and sub models, and not just those both, both models, but many, many more popular used, popularly used network models as sub models. And under this very broad model setting, I wa we want to um, provide p-value for testing whether a given pair of nodes is similar in terms of their membership um, profile or not. Okay, so that's our motivation and the goal here. And I hope it is clear. Um, all right, so this is a motivating example, but I also want to talk a few words about applications because um, you may still curious, so what's the application here? 
And there are actually a lot of applications. Uh, one application is, for instance, in brain network I mentioned before, if you suspect that the two brain regions are similar to each other in terms of functionality, then uh, we all know that in scientific study, we, we not only want to know whether the, uh, you know, not only want to know yes or no answer, right? We also want to know the confidence um, of our decision. Right, so p-value, if you can attach a p-value to your conclusion, that, that, that can be very helpful. And also in stock return network, if you want to uh, formulate a diverse portfolios, right? So if you have some level of confidence whether two stock returns are similar or not, then that can help you to form a more diverse portfolio with higher uh, level of certainty, okay? All right, um, so here is a sneak peek of our result. Um, I won't go, in, uh, go over the result in great detail, but just want to show you that uh, if you use our approach, then we can provide a pairwise p-values for testing the similarity of any given pair of nodes. And the numbers here, the off-diagonal numbers, they are the pairwise p-values uh, for testing the similarity of the corresponding nodes. Okay, um, before I introduce our method, I want to have a quick um, review of the literature. Um, and so existing literature, I think the, at a very high level, the major difference between the existing literature and our work is existing literature uh, focus on global structure of the network. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, a lot of work, a majority of the work in network inference in statistics is about community detection. So that's estimating either the group ID or the parameters in some parametric model. Okay, and there was some work um, using hypothesis test for detecting whether a given large community has a smaller, tight, uh, more tightly co uh, connected uh, um, community within it. Okay. And there is also some work uh, using hypothesis testing to infer the number of groups in a community. Okay, um, but uh, um, our work here, we focus on the local structure. As I mentioned, uh, we consider any given pair of nodes. And this can be generalized to uh, a given group of nodes as long as the uh, group size is not large enough, but still it's local. And in fact, our work is the first in the literature to provide quantified uncertainty level on community membership estimation inference. Okay. All right, so now uh, let me start with talking about our model framework and the method we use. Um, so uh, here is our model setting. Um, we consider a network uh, and a network is described by the affinity matrix I presented a few slides back. Okay, so X is a binary matrix um, and X can be decomposed into, we assume that X can be decomposed into two parts. The first part is a deterministic mean matrix of low rank. Okay, and the exact rank of it is equal to K, um, but K is assumed to be unknown but fixed. And W here is a noise matrix. Um, and we have some assumptions on W. Uh, for instance, it is symmetric. It has independent entries on and above diagonal entries. Okay. Um, and to make things uh, easy, we, uh, to make notations easy, we assume that the entries of X follows independent Bernoulli uh, distributions on and above diagonals. And the, the Bernoulli assumption is not that important. The boundedness assumption is more important, but let's just use Bernoulli uh, because that is in line with a lot of existing network uh, models and applications. All right, and um, to formally ask our hypothesis testing question, we also need to impose the community structure, right? We assume that our network uh, can be decomposed into K communities. Um, and uh, we assign a probability vector to each node. So pi is a probability vector for each node. And uh, node i belongs to, com belongs to community k with a probability pi i k, which is a case element of this vector. 
Okay, here is the formal statement of our hypothesis testing problem. Um, for any given pair of nodes i and j, our goal is to test whether their uh, membership probability vector are the same or are the different. And to formally introduce our test, we need, we need to have a little bit more extra structural information um, on the network model. So here I will break my talk into two parts. In the first part, we will consider a model which is called a mixed membership model. And in the second part, I will, we will consider a more general model which is degree corrected mixed membership model. Okay, because the tests used in these two models are different. And in fact, these two models, uh, the, the second one is broader and includes the first one as a special case. Um, however, um, our tests uh, for the second one, well, our tests for the second one can be used in the first one, um, but it has some, some stability issue if this uh, network size is not very, very large. Okay, so that's why we still consider two tests. Okay, so let's first look at a mixed membership model. And for mixed membership model, uh, the mean low rank mean matrix we just looked at uh, takes a special structure. And this is the structure of the uh, mean matrix. Um, in particular, this pi, recall that uh, um, this small pi one to pi n, they are the uh, membership probability vector for nodes, right, for n nodes. So we um, combine them together to form a matrix of n by k, okay? And the theta here is a scaling parameter, okay? Usually theta is allowed to go to zero uh, when network size goes to infinity. And the theta here actually controls the sparsity level of the network, okay? The smaller the theta, means the nodes are more, uh, are less densely connected, okay? And then the matrix inside here, sandwiched by the two pi, um, it's a k by k matrix. So it's, a relative, it's of a relatively small size. Um, and uh, the matrix entries uh, takes value between zero and one because we, want, we wanted to have the interpretation of probability. And in fact, under this model, if you write down the conditional probability that node I belongs to community K and node J belongs to community L, then the conditional probability of the two nodes being connected is theta times PKL. So as you can see that uh, um, the smaller theta, the less likely they are connected and the smaller P, the less likely that they are being connected, okay? And I also want to mention that uh, if this uh, membership probability vectors, they take special form. For instance, if each of them only takes value of, of being standard coordinate vector, then we have the stochastic block model, which was the first model I talked about in the university karate club example. Okay, and each, each node here is only allowed to belong to one uh, community in stochastic block model, okay? But we consider a general case here. So over pi i, they can be general probability vector. Okay, and I need to introduce some notations before I can show you our test statistic. Um, so notations looks um, complicated, but in fact, they mean the eigen uh, decomposition of the population mean matrix and the observed affinity matrix, okay? Um, so without hat, we have the eigen decomposition's of the population mean matrix, um, and the eigenvalues are sorted in decreasing magnitudes. And since the rank of H is K, we only have K non-zero ones. And these are the corresponding eigenvectors. Uh, with hat, we have the uh, sample eigenvector calculated from um, affinity matrix, which is a noisy version of H. All right, so let's look at our test. Let's do it step by step. So we start with the ideal version. By ideal, 
I mean that uh, uh, some population parameters are known. They are not practically uh, applicable, but they can help us understand the motivation of the test. Um, so we assume, specifically, we assume that the number of communities K is known here. Um, then um, if you look at the null hypothesis, which says that uh, node I and uh, node J, um, they have the same uh, membership probability vector. And if you go back to the eigen decomposition of H, okay, in this line here, you can see that uh, if the I's row and I's J, uh, sorry, if the I's row is equal to the J's row um, of in this matrix pi, then it's equivalent to saying that uh, in the eigen decomposition, the I's and the J's row of V matrix are the same. Okay, and and vice versa. And because of this relationship, um, it motivates to propose a hoteling type test statistic. Okay, um, so the matrix sigma one here, it is the covariance matrix of the difference of the two sample eigen, um, they are not eigenvectors, but the rows of the eigenvector matrix. Okay, and uh, fortunately, they take a relatively uh, simple explicit form. So it is a covariance matrix of this quantity here. Um, and I wrote different colors because V and D, they are deterministic population parameters which are unknown. And W is random, it's a random noise matrix, which is also unknown, right? So this says that uh, this matrix uh, sigma one how to estimate it is not very straightforward. And that's another reason why I call it the ideal test statistic. But we will look at how to estimate it using some expansion later. All right, so, so far we have this hoteling type test statistic. And using classical statistics, um, even, even if you don't have the proof, you probably can expect that the test statistic um, will have a symptotic chi-square distribution. Right, with k degrees of freedom. And that is indeed the case. But before I present the formal symptotic result, let's look at uh, uh, some tactical conditions for deriving the symptotic results. Okay. And the first condition um, is about uh, um, the, the first main condition is about uh, the eigen gap. Um, so this condition says that uh, if you look at uh, the population eigenvalues, um, there should be enough separation um, if they have the same, if they have different magnitudes, okay? And it's more of a technical assumption. And uh, we have a method to, we have proof technique to relax this condition now. But when we wrote the paper, we were not aware of how to relax it, okay? Um, and then the second one is about, uh, if you look at this one here, um, it says that uh, for each of the K communities, we should have enough number of pure nodes. By pure nodes, I mean the nodes which belong to just one community. Okay, so these are considered as anchor nodes. They are very important uh, um, in almost all community detection applications. Um, and then the parameter theta, uh, in fact, measures the sparsity level. Um, of the network. Um, so we allow theta to converge to zero polynomially fast uh, with C1 arbitrarily close to one, okay? Um, and uh, um, another thing I want to point out is uh, um, these two conditions, condition one and two together, they ensure that uh, the smallest non-zero population eigenvalue should be much larger then alpha n, which is defined as a maximum uh, row-wise summation of the variance of noise, okay? And so what's the, implement, what's the implication here? Um, the alpha n here is in fact uh, um, a measure of noise level. Um, so here, it basically says that uh, we require enough spikiness in the non-zero population eigenvalues. And so that the signal is strong enough and the inference is possible. 
All right, and about theta, I already talked about the implication of the theta, it's a sparsity level. Um, and our conditions um, allow eigenvalues to have different magnitudes, okay? Um, and also the, uh, in the separation, in the eigengap separation condition, uh, the constant, the small constant can be replaced with some small O1 term, like a small O1 over log n, okay, for instance. Um, and all results still apply. And um, so um, at last, I want to show you one simple example where all conditions are satisfied because people um, ask, like referee ask, uh, um, how can you make sure that, uh, you know, the intersection of the three conditions is not empty. And here is one simple example. Um, if you have a stochastic block model with two communities of equal size, and it can be sparse, um, and if the matrix P takes this form with A less than one, then all conditions are satisfied. All right, so under those conditions, um, we have the asymptotic uh, uh, distributions of test statistic. So the first result is um, under null hypothesis, uh, if all previous three conditions are satisfied, then we have chi-square distribution with k degrees of freedom. So that's in line, that is in line with our intuition about hoteling type test statistic. And the second condition, a second result says, if only the first two conditions are satisfied, and the last one recall that, uh, uh, last one I did not discuss much, but it's basically a technical condition saying that uh, the weight matrix in the hotel link test statistic is non-singular. Um, and if there is enough separation between node I and node J membership probability vector, then asymptotically, the test statistic uh, will be infinity, okay? Um, and so these results together can, if it, we apply it to some specific model, for instance, a stochastic block model, then you can, you can derive that uh, pi i minus pi j is square root of two because each of pi i and pi j, they can only be a standard, unit, standard coordinate vector, okay? Uh, and then both the results are satisfied. Um, so the, we will have a valid asymptotic size and asymptotic power one. All right, um, so all these theoretical results I discussed before, they were still based on ideal test statistic, right? They give us understanding, but they cannot be directly applic uh, applied in practice because of the unknown quantities K and also the weight matrix in the hotel link test statistic. So how should we address this issue? Um, so let's first consider, let's first ask a broader question. Can we identify sufficient conditions on estimators of K and sigma one, such that uh, all estimators satisfying these conditions can give us valid test, okay? And in fact, it turns out that the sufficient conditions for ensuring the nice property um, are not very restrictive. In particular, we only need an estimator of rank to be consistent and the estimator of the weight matrix to be consistent in some sense, you know, because this is a special matrix norm, okay? Um, so these are the conditions we need. And then here comes the practical question. Right? We have the sufficient conditions, but how can we de design estimates which satisfy the sufficient conditions? And since the sufficient conditions are not very restrictive, designing of estimators are not difficult either. And I want to, uh, so here we use a thresholding estimator to estimate the number of communities. Um, because K has the um, interpretation of number of communities. But on the other hand, K is also the number of non-zero eigenvalues in the population mean matrix, right? Um, and so under the spiked eigenvalue assumption, we can design a simple thresholding estimator. That is, we estimate the, we calculate the eigenvalues of the affinity matrix X and we only keep 
the top ones, uh, which are larger than some threshold. And this threshold here is upper bound of the noise level. Okay, upper, it's derived from theory. It's upper bound of the bottom, n minus k eigenvalues of x. Okay? And in the literature, there are a lot of existing methods on estimating k, and we did not use them for several reasons. One reason is a lot of these estimators are derived under some specific parametric models, different from mixed membership model. The second reason is um, we only need some estimator that is consistent. So it probably doesn't worth the effort of using a highly complicated, sophisticated estimator. Okay, um, and then it re we, re um, we still need to consider how to estimate the weight matrix sigma one, right? And sigma one, I showed you before that, it has an explicit form. It's a covariance matrix depending on noise matrix W and some population parameters. And if you drive the entry-wise formula for this matrix, it turns out it has this kind of expression. Um, v, uh, VA and VB, they are eigenvectors, population eigenvectors. And DA and DB, they are population eigenvalues. And sigmas, they are the uh, variances of the noise matrix, entry-wise variance of the noise matrix. Okay, so this motivates us to consider plug-in estimators, right? Um, and it turns out you can plug in uh, the eigenvectors by sample eigenvectors eigenvalues by sample eigenvalues. So, um, and this won't cause any problem. However, if you plug in sample version of the variance of noise matrix W, that will cause a problem. Okay, so let's take a closer look at it. And here is a definition of the entry-wise variance of the noise matrix, right? So if you have a consistent estimate K hat, and a very naive estimate of this variance is you remove the k hat, uh, k hat spike the eigenvalues and eigenvectors from the affinity matrix and you use the square term of the corresponding entry to estimate the variance, right? That seems to be very natural. However, it doesn't work because it's not accurate enough. And the fundamental reason is it is well known in random matrix literature that uh, the eigenvalues, sample eigenvalues, they are biased estimate of the population eigenvalues. So we, so we will have to correct the bias. And that motivates us to consider an iterative procedure. You start with this naive estimate of noise matrix, and then you update your eigenvalue estimate by using this formula. And the formula is motivated from the asymptotic expansion of a sample eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue, sorry. And then you can further update your noise matrix estimate by plugging the updated eigenvalue estimate, but you still use the same sample eigenvector estimate. At the end, you use squared entries of this updated noise matrix as an estimate of the variance, okay? And this gives us accurate enough estimate, at least for our purpose, okay? And that is summarized here. So both estimators satisfy the previous sufficient conditions. Um, and a very natural consequence of the previous results um, is if you design a rejection region of this form here, um, it's a slight, it's a weird uh, uh, notation because k hat is random. But I basically mean that uh, uh, you have a estimate k hat and uh, you uh, calculate the one minus inverse quantile of chi square distribution with k hat degrees of freedom, conditional k hat, and use that as your threshold, okay, as your critical point. Then, you will have a test, you will have a, a decision rule with a symptotic size alpha and a symptotic power one, okay? All right, 
so um, that's the first part of the uh, method. So that's and that was under mixed membership model. Okay. Um, and before I move to the second part, maybe I should pause for a second and ask if there are any questions. Okay, great. Um, so now let's move to the second part. Um, in the second part, uh, we consider degree corrected and mixed membership model. Okay. Um, and for people who are not familiar with those models, I need to talk about why we need such model. And what do I mean by degree corrected model? Right? And let's go back to the toy example about uh, uh, university credit club. Right? And if you look at the graph, it's easy to see that some nodes like node one and node 34, they are connected to many more other nodes than let's say node 18, right? So in other words, some nodes are more like a hub nodes. They have many more friends than some other nodes. So we call this degree heterogeneity. And we need to, and the previous model, mixed membership model, it did not allow degree heterogeneity. It assumes that on average, each node is connected to the same number of other nodes. Okay, so in order to take into account the degree heterogeneity, which is very common in practice, as you can imagine, uh, degree corrected mixed membership model um, was proposed. Okay, the difference between the previous model was for the mean matrix, low rank mean matrix, instead of multiplying a scalar here, we have a diagonal matrix. And a diagonal matrix uh, degree heterogeneity, degree parameters, okay? Um, and because of this actual matrix, the previous test uh, T is not applicable, okay? So we need to think about how to deal with this degree issue. Okay. Um, here we will use a ratio statistic. And this ratio statistic was proposed in Qing 2015 paper, but for different purpose. The purpose over there was for clustering, so still estimation aspect. And we want to use it for statistical inference. Uh, let's take a closer look at this statistic and understand why it can be used to solve the degree heterogeneity issue. So again, let's start with the model assumption, right? So this is the, um, model assumption for the low rank mean matrix. And we write, in, we write it in a different form using the eigen decomposition. And if I rewrite the whole thing by multiplying D and V to the other side, I can have an expression for V, right? And I put the whole part in red and also in parentheses. And actually we are going to denote it as B. So V can be written as theta times pi times B. And the theta is a diagonal matrix. We can further write down each entry of this V matrix in the following form, okay? And by looking at this matrix, you can observe one important thing. That is each row shares the same degree parameter. So because of this observation, you can use a column, for instance, this column, divide by the first column, but of course it's entry-wise division. Then this division will get rid of the degree effect. And that gives us, so the division is uh, mathematically takes the form here, okay? Um, and under the null hypothesis, using similar argument as I show you for T statistic, um, our T statistic, TIJ is different from the usual T we, you know, we learn in classical statistics. But anyway, so using the similar argument as before, you can uh, conclude that under the null hypothesis, the I's and the J's ratio are the same for all K from two to capital K, okay? And motivated from this, 
we can define sample versions of these ratios. And for node i, we call it vector yi. For node j, it's yj. And they are the sample version of the eigenvectors, eigenvector ratios. All right. Then we are almost back to the previous case, right? Uh, we derived that under null hypothesis, these two vectors are the same. So this motivates us to consider, again, a hoteling type statistic, right? And sigma two here um, is a population covariance matrix of some vector taking complicated form. Uh, we are not going to make a big deal of it because it's too complicated to get any insights. But let's just to say that they depend on the unknown population quantities. All right, and then the following things are quite natural, right? We are going to study the asymptotic distribution. And although we, you probably don't have a proof yet, but intuitively, it should have a chi-square distribution with k minus one degrees of freedom. And the reduced degrees of freedom is because of the ratio, okay? All right. Um, Okay, because of the time constraint, I won't uh, go into details about the condition, but let's just have some very, very high level discussion of them. Um, and some of the conditions here, they are purely technical conditions. Okay? And they are actually similar to the ones in the literature. And they may be able to be relaxed if we have more advanced tools from random matrix theory. But at this point, we are not able to relax them. Um, and again, we need the um, assumption about the pure nodes. So for each community, we need enough number of nodes belong to just this community. And we also need a sparsity assumption. So the sparsity here is measured by theta mean, which is a minimum of the degree parameters, okay? And so the network can be sparse, but it cannot be too sparse. Otherwise, the inference is impossible. And we also allow different uh, magnitudes of the non-zero population eigenvalues. Um, and uh, similar to the previous case, uh, we need a spikiness assumption. A spikiness uh, um, measures the signal strength in your data. It has to be much larger than the noise level, which is measured by the same quantity Rn. Okay, so under these conditions and our now hypothesis, um, we have the expected chi-square distribution. Uh, and then and the alternative, if the separation between pi i and pi j is large enough, we have the usual um, asymptotic infinity. Okay, and the next slide is about a practical issue, right? Estimation of the unknown parameters and the ideal uh, the idea is going to be the same, right? We estimate the K using the thresholding estimator. And we estimate the sigma two by using the expansion of each entry of it, okay? But sigma two takes much more complicated form. So I did not copy it here, but we have it uh, in our paper. And with this population, with this sample estimators plugged in, we have the same conclusion as before. And the new test statistic uh, um, satisfy all previous conditions, okay? Okay, and so here, this is the new rejection region um, based on the test statistic uh, G, okay? And there are a few remarks I want to um, talk about. The first one is, um, in both, under both model settings, our rejection regions are pivotal, although our asymptotic distributions are not. Because asymptotic distributions, they depend on, if you go back and look at here, they depend on population parameter K, which is not always known. But our rejection region is pivotal. Uh, the second one is, uh, since the second model the degree corrected mixed membership model um, contains the first model as a special case. So G can be used in either 
models, right? But we still talked about T because if you look at how G was constructed, we have the ratio. We have the ratio uh, defined here, right? And for uh, eigenvectors, the sample version, there is really no guarantee that its entry can be bounded um, away from zero by a large magnitude. And because of that, in some cases, um, the G test may suffer from um, suffer from imprecision of the because of the inverse. Okay. All right. Um, so that was the um, method and the theory. Um, let's look at some numerical results. Okay. Um, in, in the first simulation study, uh, we want to consider the ideal case where um, K is known, um, but uh, both sigma one and sigma two are estimated from data. And in this case, uh, the asymptotic null distribution for T is chi-square distribution with k degrees of freedom. And for g is chi-square distribution with k minus one degrees of freedom, right? And we want to verify that. Um, so we designed a setting where we have three communities. And for, in the first case, the network size was 1500. And theta, recall that theta measures the sparsity of network. And we allow the sparsity parameter to decrease as sample size increases. On the top, we have the result when n is 1500. On the bottom, we have the result when n is 3000. And you can see that uh, um, when n is 3000, the result is slightly better in the sense that the tail fits better than in the 1500 case. And if you try even larger networks, then the trend will be even more clear. And on the right, there are corresponding results for G statistic. Okay. And R square here, I did not talk about the ex its exact meaning, but let's just understand it at a high level. Um, again, this measures the sparsity of the network. Okay, so those, those were for checking the symptotic null distribution. Right, so let's take a look at the size and the power of our test under the same networks. And when we change the sparsity of the network, uh, which is measured by theta under mixed membership model and measured by R squared under degree corrected membership model. And we can see that uh, as sparsity, uh, when theta increases, the sparsity decreases means that the problem is easier because we have more information um, caused by the denser connectivity, right? And you can see that the size becomes more and more accurate. Um, and the power has always been very good, okay? Um, all close to one, except for this case here, okay? And when the network size is 3000, and all results are relatively better, Okay, and all powers are one. Okay, so the previous results were for k known, right? So now we take into account the estimated k. And we use our simple thresholding estimator. And for mixed membership model, um, we present the probability of correctly estimating the rank. And they have been estimated very well, 100%. Um, in the mixed membership uh, model, okay? And for degree correct in the mixed membership model, um, when the sparsity is high, at the beginning, the correct estimation is not very good, right? And when it is dense, the estimation is very accurate. And our search holding estimator in the sparse case gives us an underestimate. And the result of this ender estimation is we have relatively low power, but the size is still pretty precise. And it's actually expected because the ender estimation reduces the chi-square by one degrees of freedom. It, it, it's like you drop one eigenvector. 
Okay, but you still have the valid asymptotic chi-square distribution. But because of the dropped uh, useful eigenvector, you lose some power. Okay, um, I think I'm almost out of time. So uh, let me speed up. So I have two real data results. And for the first real data, we consider US uh, political data. So here we have 105 political books sold online. Um, and the books are considered to be connected if they are co-bought by a lot of buyers. And the data set has also been studied multiple times in the literature. And in particular, Newman manually assigned labels to the 105 books. Um, he labeled them as conservative, liberal, and neutral. And because they are manually assigned, so you can imagine that the labels may not be extremely accurate. Um, here we want to use uh, data, you know, we want to use machine learning method to a statistical learning method to let data tell us the labels, okay? So we, we ignore the label considered here. And we, we applied both tests T and G to this data. Um, here I'm only presenting the result by G test because we believe that uh, these 105 nodes, they have degree heterogeneity. And that is pretty obvious from the data itself. And we have a table summarizing the p-values for some selected books. But uh, you know, for talk, probably the graph is better for providing understanding. Um, so in our implementation, uh, we consider network uh, um, having k communities, uh, two communities. So we consider the neutral ones as having mixed membership. And the two plots here, on the left, we provide a multi-dimensional scaling plot based on test statistic, pairwise test statistic. And on the right, we provide the con connectivity based on the pairwise p-values, but we stretch out, out those super small p-values. And the colors, they correspond to Newman's coding. So you can see that uh, under both plots, uh, majority of the books we have consistent result as Newman's coding. But for some, like these are conservative ones, the data says they should be uh, mixed membership ones. Okay. And, uh, um, and then the second result is about the stock return network. Um, so here we have 500 stocks from SP500 from January 2009 to December 2019. And we pre-processing the data by dropping uh, stocks with missing values or two small variances. And we end up with 404 stocks. Okay? And because we all know that uh, stock returns are driven by some common factors, right? For instance, the Pharma French is three factors. So we remove the effect of the common factors. And then affinity matrix is constructed by the correlation of the residuals from removing, obtained from removing the common factors. And the plot here shows the result, okay? Uh, it's based on our test G. And you can see that roughly we have three communities and these are the mixed membership ones. If you take a close look at those nodes, uh, three communities, uh, here we have from this direction to the center, we have retail, restaurant and the real estate. And this cluster, majority of the companies are in tech, uh, in, in tech field. And then this part here, moving from here to the center, we have health care and energy. All right, uh, my time is up, so let me wrap up. Um, so today I presented uh, uh, work, recent work, where we want to use statistical inference to study a network problem. In particular, we consider broad class of models, uh, mixed uh, uh, degree correct in a mixed membership model. It, 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 consist, it contains um, most popularly used network models in the literature. And under this model, we propose the test statistic and provide p-values, okay? Um, and we are working on extending the test to uh, some other settings, for instance, for group inference and for uh, 
non-sharp um, null hypothesis. Okay, and here are two related uh, papers summarizing the results. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Yingying, for all the uh, very interesting talk. Um, uh, Lai, I guess we typically would have a QA and uh, a if anybody has questions in the box. Um, uh, I don't see anything being input here. I'm just wondering if uh, anybody has any questions. Maybe you can ask it directly. Uh, yeah, yes, I do have a question. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk. It's a really great talk. My first question has to do with the uh, multiplicity of the test arising when you have very large scale data. Um, in eigenvalues, right? Yes, yeah. So uh -huh. uh, in, when you apply this to large scale data, how would uh, it be adjusted? Uh, sorry, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Are you talking about the multiplicity in eigenvalues? Uh, uh, actually, it's a multiplicity for evaluate for testing the pairwise. Uh, mm, I see. The, the okay. membership. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. Um, so uh, that's a great question. That's actually one direction I want, we want to extend it to. So right now it's pairwise, and as you can imagine, um, the pairwise p-values are actually correlated because they are based on the same data. So right now, my suggestion is you use, for instance, the benjamin hodgeberg procedure um, and to control FDR when you want to apply to a group of nodes, okay? Um, but uh, we believe that uh, the idea can be extended to a group by designing a more sophisticated statistic. But at this point, I don't have an affirmative answer to the later approach. Thank you. Uh, my second question, actually, I found you have a very nice plot for the stocks data interpreting the mixed mm -hmm. membership. I'm curious for the other example, the uh, political books example, whether there's an intuitive way to interpret uh, some books that have a mixed uh, memberships. Uh -huh. Great question. So in our paper, we listed nine books and we picked the nine books also because our G test is based on the uh, ratio test proposed in June 2015 paper. And this discussed the nine books after their clustering. And uh, we, we discussed the same nine books because the nine books, uh, they are not very consistent with Newman's mm -hmm. hand labeled data. And for some books, uh, we can, and usually the nine books, uh, they are in this range. And, and I don't really have the labels on my slides. But for some of the books, we can see very interesting phenomena. Um, they are labeled, they were labeled by Newman as conservative book, but it, it, has a, it had a liberal author or vice versa. So there are actually some interesting interpretations, um, but we will have to look at the book one by one. And right. uh, I thought yeah. I didn't have time to go over that. So I did not include them. Oh, that's very helpful, thank you. Thank you. And Zheng Ling, I, I see you raise your hand. Uh, you, I guess you can go ahead, please. Thank you. It's a very nice talk. I have one question. So uh, is it equivalent by testing the, say, pi i equal to pi j to uh, testing the ratio is equal? Uh, the re the, you're talking about the g, right? The second yes, test. The second okay. method, yeah. So let me go there so it's easier to talk with the formula. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Yes, they are equivalent. I see. After this ratio transformation, they are equivalent. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions? I I have a also have a question actually. Um, so I'm curious. Um, um, so um, what if you have a network firstly um, being observed, uh, and in addition to that. Um, you observe the network for some time and there may be some activities, um, you know, being shown by, um, from each of the nodes. But with that uh -huh. information, um, can the information be incorporated? Would that information be helpful to better or, or define the community differently? That's a great question. I think that that's related to dynamic network, uh, which is definitely one of the future directions we want to explore. 
So it's very natural for networks to evolve over time because of some covariates or some other factors. Yeah. Uh -huh. I guess it's not necessary. It's not um, necessary that you network itself evolves. Mm -hmm. It's just like you would have, like if you still have the same network, for example, you still mm -hmm. have the ones and zeros still the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but you just observe some further information, like for example. Oh, okay. Um, Covariates, right? In, well, it's just a behavior. Like for example, you think about a let's say the a network that they're fixed, mm -hmm. um, but uh, somebody a social network, somebody makes some post mm -hmm. um, in my network. Uh, I may retweet uh, the person's post um, or some people in my network, but not everybody, right? That probably means I'm, even though there are a lot of people that are connected with me, but only some really have a similar kind of interest or behavior as I do. Mm -hmm. um, so can, can such kind of information be incorporated to, I mean, maybe that can help to define, you know, that's the community that I'm in uh, mm -hmm. versus just, just uh, everybody in the network. I mean, that the information we get from that one alone. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I uh, frame the question. <laughs> Uh, correctly, I mean clearly or not, but but I, it's just like a feature, right? You, you can uh -huh. understand that as some features. Uh, can the features be incorporated to um, not only uh, detect the community but also actually define the problems from the very beginning? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, we haven't thought about that yet, um, but I do know that in the in network literature, there has been some work taking into account, uh, like you mentioned, the feature information, mm -hmm. and that helps. Because um, after all, that gives you more information, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that to what extent it can help will really depend on a specific question. And yeah. I know for community detection, in some, uh, I, I think I was in one talk, uh, the result I saw uh, was for that particular problem, um, the author tried to answer, the feature information helps with the precision, but to a constant level it does not improve the read or something. But again, I think that that really depends on what kind of question you try to answer. Probably mm -hmm. the feature can give you much information for some specific questions, but not general, not all. And, and the other thing is uh, if you have, um, like you consider a social network, I mean, there mm -hmm. are easily millions and millions of users. Mm -hmm. How would you uh, define the communities? I mean, there may be the, the number of communities would go to infinity also. That's possible. Um, so the work here does not, uh, you know, uh, we haven't applied it to such huge network yet. Um, and I think, uh, so the problem of estimating number of community itself is hard. It, it hasn't been, there has been some work, but I wouldn't say that it has been solved, uh, especially for very large networks. And the existing methods are still based on some simple like thread holding rule um, or slightly more uh, sophisticated, uh, for instance, the likelihood based uh, or cross validation method. And those methods, because of the complexity, it does not apply to such huge networks. And right now, I think people use very ad hoc method to select the number of communities. Um, for instance, uh, you can plot the eigenvalues because PCA is not that expensive. You can always get eigenvalues and you plot it empirically. If you find a sharp drop, then that's where you choose your K to be. And the K can be diverged with network size. But the statistical theory lags behind. At least for the theory and method I saw, um, I am not aware of any um, that can deal with divergent number of K. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks you. again. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for the uh, very interesting talk. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks again for inviting me and let me stop sharing.